point to you is make sure that anything you are doing in terms of analyzing or deciding and implementing decisions with respect to employee related issues uh, before you actually you know make a decision execute on that decision implement it etc that you have fully thought through sort of 360 degree analysis of what are all of the things that could go wrong with that decision prior to you executing and implementing that decision. It's just really important. And for, for example, when we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, in the Tennessee Chamber events, we were doing the initial presentations, we're discussing, you know, the FFCRA and, and what, what does that mean, who qualifies, when do they qualify, et cetera, et cetera. You'll remember that we talked about a host of other legal implications as well. For example, the ADA, the FLSA, the FMLA, the National Labor Relations Act, OSHA, work comp, um, you know, et cetera. So I just want to reiterate that it is extremely important that you be thinking big picture in, in all of your uh, analytic, analytical uh, exercises that you go through. Um, a, a related point that I wanted to talk about, because I, I have, it's this, this uh, snowball is just starting to run downhill and some of you have experienced it, others of you have not yet experienced it, but you will in the near future. But you know, the par part of this equation where employers were figuring out how to react and to, you know, for many of you lay, lay employees off, that, that was you know, traumatic in, on many fronts, but it was not the most complicated part of the process, okay? The, the most complicated part of the process is what do we do next week or next month as you start bringing employees back to work because there are many more moving pieces and parts uh, in, in that arena. For, for example, you know, for those of you who have laid off people, I am assuming that some of you, uh, if you laid off 50 people, for example, I'm, I'm assuming that you might have with 80% uh, 80, 80 of that population that you laid off, you may have laid them off temporarily uh, with an intention to return them to work. You may, with some people, you may just have furloughed them uh, because you anticipated you might need them periodically during this, this uh, break in service and you wanted to maintain their health insurance benefits, which you wouldn't be doing normally when you, uh, if you were laying somebody off temporarily. But you might have a segment of that population, a small segment, or maybe not, maybe a larger segment, that you're laying off temporarily with no, no uh, anticipated expectation of re re rehiring that person at some point in time. In other words, you've decided that, you know, based on these circumstances, even if things get ramped back up and, and you're rolling again in the near future, some of these employees you don't want to bring back uh, for any variety of reasons. And when you're going through that analysis, um, as to who you're going to bring back and who you're not going to bring back, et cetera. As you might imagine, um, employees who are not rehired and they learn that their buddies were rehired and brought back to work are, are very likely to bring discrimination charges uh, against you or potentially retaliation charges if they've engaged in some form of protected activity. So this whole sort of reintegrating people back to work, you know, just from the sort of discrimination retaliation perspective, it's going to be a complicated process. And then you need to be thinking about, you know, we talked uh, about the OSHA general duty clause in our prior sessions with the with Tennessee SHRM. Um, you know, the OSHA duty, general duty clause requires us to provide a safe work environment. Well, given the nature of this virus, how, how, do, we, how do we really know if we're providing a safe work environment? Every work environment is different. Blue collar environments are definitely different than white collar environments. Um, you know, service industries like food industries, et cetera, are very different than, than non-service industries. Um, so, you know, the, the, the deal is going to be that every one of you is going to have to be thinking about what, what hoops am I going to have to jump through in order to provide a safe workplace and meet my OSHA general duty clause requirements. You know, obviously you've got CDC and other entities that provide us with, with good guidance, but every workplace is different. So there are a whole host of issues that are gonna be fairly um, challenging uh, to grapple with as we start trying to reopen business and get back up onto step uh, where we were prior to everything kind of uh, 
uh, coming to a screeching halt in the middle of March. So at the outset of this session, I just wanted to just put those items on your radar screen, because if you're not thinking about these things now, you need to be. You need to have some sort of a written game plan as to what it is you're gonna to do to try and come up back to speed operationally, and you know how you're gonna deal with your safe work environment uh, requirements. How are you going to, you know, what analytics or metrics are you gonna to apply to which employees you're bringing back and which employees you're not bringing back? And for the employees you're bringing back, are you bringing them back in the same position or different position? Are you bringing them back at the same rate of pay or at a lower rate of pay? Um, are you going to be theoretically bring back some white collar exempt employees and now make them hourly non-exempt employees because of the change in business model? Um, there, there are just a whole host of issues that I commend to you for analysis um, as you are thinking about what you're going to do over the next couple of weeks. So, um, Beth, if it's okay, can I stop, take a, a 30 second like uh, breath there and see if anybody has any strenuous comments or objections to what I just put out there? Absolutely. Um, if you wanna just share something in the comment box, if you have any concerns or um, specific questions to what Fred just shared, that would be great. I don't see any dissenting comments, Fred, so I think you're good to go. Good, good. All right, Let, let's talk about then, uh, let me transition to the um, unemployment piece of this. Uh, and, and I wanna sort of segment uh, this between uh, you know, pre-coronavirus and post-coronavirus, okay? In, in prior to like the middle of March, uh, we, if you had called us and said, hey, I'm going to be parting ways with an employee uh, for one reason or other, whether it's a reduction in force, uh, whether it's you're outsourcing um, that that job, or it's just that you know you're going to let somebody go because they're they're not living up to you know any of the expectations you might have for them. Our, our guidance is consistent across our firm that unless somebody is stealing from you or they started a fight in the workplace or they otherwise engaged in super egregious behavior, that there is little to no upside in contesting unemployment benefits for a couple of reasons. I, I want, and this background is helpful, you know, uh, giving sort of a, a foundation before I segue into, you know, post -corona, coronavirus uh, world. And that is that in, 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 inevitably, if you contest an, an employee's unemployment benefits application and you prevail, they don't have any income stream available to them. So their only remedy is to file a comp claim against you, file a charge of discrimination, file a lawsuit, make some sort of wage and hour complaint, whatever, whatever it is, right? But you, you, to some extent, you back them into a corner. And so then, you know, you win the battle on unemployment and you kind of lose the war because then you end up with some sort of a legal claim that you spend five, or six times the amount of money just defending preliminarily, let alone if you get into litigation. And the other part of that equation is that it almost inevitably, um, especially if there's an appeals hearing, the appeals hearing is under oath. And so uh, there is a verbatim record of all the testimony that you render in the appeals hearing. And if you are not properly prepared and the employee shows up with a lawyer and start, that lawyer starts cross-examining you, you know, you would, might get trapped into saying something under oath that you are now bound to so that when you subsequently get sued, you've made an admission against the company's interest that you can't back out of and you end up, you know, settling a lawsuit, you know, for a lot more than it might be worth because, you know, you, there were missteps made in the unemployment compensation process. So based on those potential issues, our guidance was basically what I laid out earlier that except in very rare circumstances, opposing application for unemployment benefits really is risky business unless you have the goods on somebody and they've just engaged in absolutely egregious behavior. Okay, so that, that's sort of a, a foundational, that's our philosophy. Some of you may have a different philosophy. Some of you may over the years have uh, been very used to fighting unemployment uh, benefit applications for people who you terminated because of they had attendance violations or because they just were a bad employee. 
and and you know again that that's that's an individualized decision i can tell you I, i've already told you what our philosophy on dealing with those issues is but as we move into the covid-19 world you know the, the world definitely has changed and and if you look at the uh, unemployment statistics both locally statewide and nationally they're somewhat horrific right there are lots and lots of people who are out of work and who are you know basically without any source of income or money to support themselves and their families which is not good for anybody um, and if you follow the news at all you're, you're aware of the fact that even if people have timely applied and been approved for benefits it can be a very long time uh, before they start collecting those benefits I've heard stories of people who were approved in the middle of uh, March who are still not receiving those benefits yet some six weeks later and you know now they're they don't now they're in their second month of how do I pay my rent how do I eat etc so you know thinking about how we approach unemployment in, in this setting it, it's a little bit different um, so the first point is that you know to the extent that you can help your employees facilitate their unemployment benefits application uh, such that they can get paid sooner rather than later that is a good thing for them it's a good thing for you it's a good thing for us collectively uh, that people are not defaulting on their mortgages and all this kind of stuff that that leads to horrific economic consequences for all of us and you will normally uh, when the application is made you will get uh, an inquiry from the Tennessee Department of Labor uh, you know to the extent that you can provide accurate information in a timely manner uh, in, in a manner that they can read and understand that is a really good thing to do because it helps facilitate the process and as you know the process right now it's not working all that well uh, for a lot of our employees who uh, have been laid off etc um, again as to whether or not you're going to oppose an application um, my guidance on that hasn't changed pre COVID-19 to post COVID-19. Um, I, I think that you need to be very, very thoughtful and deliberate about whether or not you want to incur the time and expense of opposing an application, because even if you win, you may lose in the long run, given the fact that you're just going to prompt somebody who has no other resources and is a bad situation uh, with any option other than to, to pursue legal action against you. The other thing is, quite frankly, I don't know how timely the Tennessee Department of Labor will be in, in entertaining, investigating uh, any sort of opposition. And if you were to appeal um, a grant of benefits to somebody, my guess is it's, it's going to be quite a while before they actually work you through the process, uh, other than the paper process and even the paper, initially the first round appeal, which is a paper process, my guess is, is that 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 process will be delayed. So uh, I know that some of you are concerned about fraud. Um, I know for a fact, I've had clients that have had employees who have tried to, to apply for and collect unemployment benefits since this scenario broke loose in the middle of March uh, that were fraudulent. And, and the bottom line is, is that in, in, in that case, yes, we are going to you know, put together a package of information that outlines why we think a person is committing fraud. Uh, we will timely submit it uh, and ask the Tennessee Department of Labor to do their investigation and to figure out what the deal is so that a, a, an informed decision can be made. Um, my, my anticipation is that those investigations will be slow in developing, uh, decisions will be delayed. And you know, in many cases, uh, you know, people who are committing fraud, you know, they may collect benefits for a, a period of time uh, before, you know, the wheels of justice uh, catch up with them. But big picture, uh, one, the wheels of justice will most likely catch up with them. And the other thing is, if you have somebody who has, who you laid off, who engages in that type of behavior, one of the things you want to be thinking about is, you know, what battle do you really want to fight with them? Is the unemployment battle the battle you want to fight with them? Or is it, okay, you know, you can, you can file a claim and you can make fraudulent representations as to your eligibility for, for unemployment compensation benefits. You know, we can submit our uh, written opposition to, to your application. 
But if we know, based upon what the information provided by the Tennessee Department of Labor, that that employee has knowingly submitted false information, guess what? That's going to be a very good factual basis for us to use when we're deciding which employees we are and are not going to come back to work. Because most of you, even if you, I don't care if it's somebody who's pushing a broom or, or, or if it's a, a C-suite level employee, if you know that a person is going to perpetrate fraud, uh, you know, and is inclined to engage in that type of behavior, well, then that gives you a, a legitimate, non-discriminatory, non-retaliatory reason why you might not bring somebody back to work uh, because you don't want people in your workforce who engage in, in fraud, fraudulent type behavior, especially if they have access to, to money in, in, or assets, uh, et cetera. So a couple of big picture uh, thoughts there. Let, let me ask, does anybody have any thoughts, comments, questions on, on that? Okay. Beth, do you want to move to the next slide? Okay. Um, okay. So you guys are familiar with the fact that that state benefit is, is $275. Um, with the CARES Act, this the two primary issues that we have are that the one week waiting period has been waived and that you have a $600 benefit that is on top of the state benefit. And there are some cases where you may have a scenario where somebody doesn't qualify for the state benefit of $275, but, but they very well may qualify for the 600 CARES Act benefit because part of, um, part of the, the applicable federal law uh, deals with you know, providing unemployment benefits to people who otherwise wouldn't qualify under the state law, for example, independent contractors, gig, gig workers, et cetera, normally are not considered employees such that they would qualify for the state benefit. So depending upon who is applying and what their relationship to you is, um, you know, the, the, the benefit is, is probably, or it can vary, but the primary benefit is gonna be about $875 for most people. Now, one of the, one of the Beth, go to the next slide if you don't mind, please. Um, and two, two things, I, I, I need to clarify this. I, this, I think, as I, I may have misinterpreted when I was typing this up, the um, maximum time frame is, uh, it's up to four months ending on July 31st. So it depends upon, uh, it just depends upon when it is that an employee applies as to whether or not they can get this benefit. Uh, but the, the, that $600 benefit right now, and again, this law could be amended depending upon how the economy shakes out, but right now it ends as of July 31st, 2020, 2020 and an employee can collect up to four months. So theoretically, if an employee was eligible starting like March 15th, um, that would give them April, May, June, I don't know, let me go back. If it was... Uh, in February 15th, they would qualify, it would be March, April, May, and June. So like June June 15th, theoretically, they would have uh, utilized their four months and, and that would be it. Um, so it can be up to a total of four months ending on July uh, 31st. Um, and then this 13 week, uh, what I was referring to in the 13 weeks is that, um, as I understand it, you know, in, the ten in Tennessee, you can get unemployment for up to 26 weeks. That's the standard. Um, however, it appears that the federal law is going to extend that uh, out another 13 weeks, so it can be up to a total of 39 weeks of unemployment. But that $600 federal kicker is limited to four months and it expires right now on July 31st. So anyway, I hope I don't confuse you with that, but, but those are sort of the, the dollar figures and the time frame parameters on, on this issue. Okay. All right. Can you please help me better understand the ability to qualify for the, all right, let, let, go back to the prior slide. I'm going to come back to that question if you don't mind. Um, the second bullet point that um, somebody can collect this up to $875 um, 
even if it's more than they otherwise would have earned. That's obviously a problem in, in, in terms of you may have people who are very comfortable collecting $875 a week because they normally make $500 a week. And so you're going to get into an interesting scenario um, is uh, you're going to get into an interesting scenario when you call them back to work and they're like, yeah, well, you know, you pay me 500 bucks a week. Uh, I think I'm going to sit out another couple of weeks until I maximize this 875 a week because this is a pretty good gig. Uh, we're going to talk about that because that disincentive doesn't make a lot of sense. But the bottom, bottom line is, is that, you know, this $600, if somebody qualifies, they're getting for unemployment, they're getting the $600 on top of any state benefit that applies. So, so I will come back to that in the context of the return to work process. All right, so let's look at these two questions. Um, can you please help me understand better the ability to qualify for the federal 600, even if ineligible for the state's 275? I was advised by state that if they were eligible for 275, they're automatically eligible for the 600. Well, the second part of your question is correct. Um, if they qualify for the 275, they're automatically going to be, they were also, autom let me reread re re this. I was advised by the state that if they were ineligible for the 275, they're automatically ineligible for the 600. I don't know that that is correct because my understanding is that um, some of the folks who are like gig workers and independent contractors, et cetera, would not necessarily qualify for the 275 but they would qualify for the 600. So that's something I'd have to double check. But based on what I've read, it appears to me, um, it appears to me that you could get the 600 and not get the 275. All right, let me, where's, how do I get the, Beth, how do I get that second? Or was that? When I'm sharing my screen, I am not seeing the questions. My okay. chat box is empty. I'm not sure why. Probably user error. Oh, there we go. All right, so that was Lauren's question. Lauren, I think I answered that correctly. If I, I'll look at that afterwards. If I didn't answer it correctly, I will circle back and get with you. But that was my understanding. I think the, the vast majority of people are going to be qualifying for the state benefit, which means they're gonna get the federal benefit. The scenario I posed to you there is like a, a very small percentage of the people who are applying who, who might not be technically deemed an employee under state law for state unemployment, but they are a gig worker or independent contractor that's otherwise contemplated under the federal law. Um, so anyway, that's something I'd have to confirm. Uh, the additional 600 is that charge back to the company? I can't say with 100% certainty. Uh, I, my understanding is that the $600 is strictly federal money and that that is being paid by the federal government. Now, obviously the federal government gets their money from us. So in some other form or fashion, are, are we gonna be paying, paying that back? Uh, obviously, yes, uh, but I don't believe that it's being charged to the employers. That's my understanding. Um, and then there's a question, how are people working reduced, out, reduced hours impacted? They're eligible, eligible, but for how much? Yes, um, as I understand it, um, they can, you can apply for partial unemployment and then the state does a calculation, and I can't sit here and quote you the calculation. I've read what the calculation is, but um, it, it's not something I can spit out and regurgitate on, on demand. But there is a calculation uh, based upon how much they're earning as to what they would be entitled to. It's how much they're earning now versus how much they were earning, and then they, they factor what part, part of the up to 275 they would otherwise. Okay. Uh, and that, again, that's a calculation that the Tennessee Department of Labor is going to make. And it, it's one of those things that at this point in time, um, given the fact that the folks at the TDOL are so swamped, I don't know that I would be getting too wrapped around the axle about that. Um, if there are some issues that need to be resolved, I think on the back end as things settle down and the folks at the TDOL are not so swamped, certainly you can address those issues with them and make sure that for ex purposes of your experience modifier, uh, that, that the right calculations have been made. Okay, I talked about, well, this, this slide just reflects the fact that there are non-traditional people who are now eligible for, for unemployment benefits who in the past were not. Okay, Beth, let's go to the next one. All right, so this is, well, I am assuming that um, this is uh, 
one of the most problematic issues that you guys are concerned about. So let, let's talk about this because this is really, this has been a constant source of confusion, especially the last two weeks where some employers have been trying to bring at least bits and pieces of their workforce back, uh, anticipating a ramp up in the near future. Um, so if and, if and when an employee returns to work, um, their eligibility for unemployment benefits end. And uh, it is important, uh, if you had laid somebody off um, and so either temporarily or temporarily or permanently and you decide to bring them back, um, my understanding is that you would want to file with the Department of Labor the new hire form so that way it would be on, you would be on record indicating as to when that employee came back to work and then there's going to be some, some degree of a trust factor with the employee because if the employee continues to collect those benefits and doesn't tell the department that they've returned to work for you, then they've got, then there's going to be a fraud investigation. Um, now, again, most people I think are going to, when you bring them back to work, are going to, uh, when they have to check in weekly, they're going to tell the TDOL, oh, I'm returning to work on a date certain, such that the TDOL can stop their benefits uh, on an, in an appropriate manner. But that's the general process that will need to be um, uh, undertaken. You, you will need to have, obviously, your own internal written records as to when you're bringing people back, including your payroll records. Um, but if they, people are in a layoff status such that they are, no, they are technically separated from employment and you're bringing them back to work, then that notice of rehire form being filed with the Department of Labor certainly is a good practice to follow so that you can ensure at some point that the accounting is, is uh, dealt with appropriately. Um, now, what about when, and this has been the question we've had from a lot of clients, what about when an employee declines to return to work? We, we have literally had clients who have talked to employees about coming back to work and they have said, I make more on this unemployment at 875 a week than I do working for you. I wanna stay off, I don't wanna come back to work until this is my, my time to collect this money is expired. Well, and one of the other problems we had was we had clients calling and telling us, well, you know, if you watch the local news here in Middle Tennessee, there were certain news channels that were saying that an employee didn't have to return to work when they were offered the opportunity to return to work and that they could still collect benefits. Now, I haven't seen any such uh, statements made by any of the local news channels. I'm not saying they weren't made. I'm just saying I didn't see him, but I can tell you as of last night, um, I was watching the local news on channel four and their investigative reporter represented that she had spoken to a spokesperson for the Tennessee Department of Labor yesterday and posed this very question and that the Tennessee Department of Labor's response was once an employer makes an offer of return to work, that as of a date certain, as of that date certain, the employee's eligibility for unemployment benefits ends. In other words, if the employee declines to come back to work as of the date that you offer them the opportunity to return to work, that their eligibility for these unemployment benefits ends. And so then the next question is, someone's gonna say, well, Fred, what do I do in that scenario? Um, and that's the type of scenario in which you're going to notify the department, we made an offer of employment for this employee to return to work as of this date, um, they have uh, declined and or refused to come back to work. Um, you know, they're, they're just FYI, right? And then we're going to let the Tennessee Department of Labor, that from they, they will take it from there. You know, will they timely cut off this person's benefits, you know, to be determined? Um, clearly, though, if somebody abuses that process, they're setting themselves up for a fraud situation with the Tennessee Department of Labor, which is just, you know, it's a problem. Now, that being said, there are a couple of different scenarios here. You know, and then the second scenario is one that has uh, been very common, is some, somebody is, they're just flat out afraid. And I, I understand why. You know, if you, if you um, are watching the national news and you see these statistics, you know, some, some, some of the stuff is pretty scary. Um, and even though things here in Middle Tennessee haven't been as bad as they've been like in New York and, and the East Coast, uh, there's not, Nothing saying it won't get bad if people come back to work and our you know society goes back uh, to to business as usual and people aren't paying attention to these you know social distancing guidelines etc. 
Um, and so some people may say, well, I'm just afraid to come back to work. You know, that I'm afraid to come back to work, absent some, some sort of objective, uh, objectively verifiable concerns, um, is not going to be a get out of jail free card for the employees uh, who, or former employees who have been offered the opportunity to return to work. And in that scenario, that's where you would tell them, listen, we, we've, we've made you an offer to return to work. If you're not coming back to work because you're afraid, look, we understand that you're afraid. A lot of people are afraid. Um, it's your decision. We can't force you to come back to work. Um, but you know, understand that if that's your decision, that's your decision, then we're, we're gonna move on. Um, Beth, is that the sign that I should answer questions? Yes, there's a few um, that have, have added up while you've been talking. So um, uh, let's see, start with. Um, right. Let me go down. Uh, Terry Norris at the bottom, and I guess I'll work my way up. If an essential worker chooses to self-isolate without an underlying medical condition, high risk, or due to exposure, will they qualify? Um, well, the term essential worker really is, is relevant to who can work and who can't work under the governor's order. Um, obviously, uh, if they don't have a, a medical-based reason, either for themselves or based on a family member who has a compromised immune system, um, and they choose not to work, uh, just that, that's sort of the, they're just basically, they're saying they're afraid. That's a scenario where technically speaking, they, they don't qualify, and then you would just notify the department that you've made an offer for them to return to work, they've refused it, and it, the department's going to do what they're going to do with it. If they if they cut off the benefits, then the that employee has an opportunity to appeal. He or she can go ahead and, and explain why it is that they think that they should come back. They should be allowed to con continue collecting benefits. I will say this much because this is the type of scenario that leads to litigation. That when you encounter that type of scenario, it is going to be essential that you are at correctly and, and appropriately discussing the scenario with the employee to investigate why they are afraid. You know, is there some objectively verifiable reason or is it just totally subjective, right? Are they a worry wart and they're just, they watch the news and it freaks them out? Well, that, that's great, but that doesn't, you know, qualify them for unemployment benefits. And you're gonna to need to have your documentation to file done in a, in a contemporaneous and appropriate manner so that if you have to provide anything to the Department of Labor, it's already, pre, it's already prepared. Um, and obviously, if you if you get subsequently get into litigation a year from now over it, you know you're not going to remember the details if you're not jumping through the appropriate hoops of documenting things now. And the second part is if if high risk, what documentation is required to to qualify, if any? Um, if somebody is a is a high risk, they have a medical condition. Um, certainly, if you already have an existing FMLA uh, medical certification on file let's just say somebody has some sort of immune system related issue and in the last two years or so, they've taken FMLA leave to address that type of an issue. Um, you have some medical information. I think it would certainly be a good thing to ask the employee to, to, to obtain uh, some medical statement from his or her provider indicating that given the threat that COVID-19 poses to people with immune system issues, that, that that this employee should be staying at home uh, because in that case, you know, they may not qualify for unemployment, but they very well may qualify uh, under, under uh, the pay, at least for that, that two week period. Or, um, you know, if they are in a furloughed status as opposed to being laid off, uh, you know, if they're furloughed and therefore still on your payroll and, and on your health insurance, you know, maybe they have, forms of paid leave available to them otherwise. Um, okay, revision to my question above, same process as filing and mass, I'll have to go above. Can, it, can this rehire form be filled in mass? My answer is I don't know, but I do know that there's the spreadsheet you can file that is a mass layoff file. Um, that's a good question. I, I would assume, I would assume that the department would probably take such a document if you properly indicated that you are uh, rehiring people en masse, uh, but that's speculation on my part. I don't see anything, I didn't read anything in their guidance that indicated, that specifically addressed this question, but it's the exact flip side 
of when you're doing a mass, uh, a mass layoff. So it seems to me, just from a practical perspective, that you ought to be able to use that same type of form um, and see if they can use it for the reverse situation. Okay. And Fred, I will ask Marla, she had to jump off the call, but I will try to get clarification yeah, on that from her. And then next one's question is about associates who cannot work because daycares are closed. We have several, and the online research I did indicate that unemployment officials look at it on a case by case basis, just wondering what criteria they look for. Yeah, I, you know, so this daycare issue, you know, that is, that is going to be, um, well, if somebody, so let me kind of splitting hairs here again, okay? If somebody's in a furlough status, such that they are still on your group health insurance, et cetera, they probably have an argument that they're entitled to the extended FMLA benefits, okay? If they are in a layoff status where they are separated from your employment, that's a different deal. So they, they are no longer an employee, so they don't qualify for the extended FMLA benefits. Um, then in terms of what, it, what is it that the Department of Labor would be looking at, um, my, my guess is that they would be looking at what other potential alternatives the employee has. In other words, do they have family members or other daycare available to them? Um, and is this just they're sort of self-selecting so that they can collect benefits? Or is it truly a hardship based on um, th this scenario? Uh, I have not, just to be specific though, I have not seen any guidance um, that speaks to that issue in, in specific. And one of the things that I have, but I have, I can say this, that I know for a fact in some of the issues that our clients, we've helped our clients with, that the Department of Labor is being super, super flexible and somewhat lenient with approving benefits. Um, and I think that the, their analysis is simply that there are so many people who are hurting that, you know, if they are even remotely uh, within the parameters for qualifying for benefits, we'd rather they have the benefits so they can pay their mortgages instead of, uh, you know, getting evicted, et cetera. Um, so it would not surprise me that in the immediate future that if somebody is saying, look, I would otherwise be able to work, but I don't have daycare and I don't qualify for EFMLA uh, or anything like that, um, and, you know, therefore I, I need unemployment. It would not surprise me if at least temporarily the Department of Labor was cutting people some slack on that. And I'll give you, a, it's a related type of an example. I had a, a client with an employee who quit his job to go take another job. And um, when he went from employer A to employer B, he didn't tell employer B that he had a restrictive covenant. And so when we sent the cease and desist letter to him and his new employer, his new employer interviewed him and said, hey, I asked you if you had a restrictive covenant. And when I hired you, that was the first question I asked you and you said no. And he's the, the employee admitted that to his new employer, basically he lied, so they fired him. And he applied for unemployment benefits. And the department, even though he was fired for good cause because he lied about something very significant, the uh, TDL approved him for benefits immediately. And so my client was like, wait a second, why is this guy getting unemployment benefits when he quit? Like I'm paying for unemployment. He quit. He left. I didn't fire him. He had a job here. And then he went to another place of employment, lied to get that job and then gets fired because he lied. And now he's getting unemployment. How does that work? And my answer is, Rules are different now. The department's just simply going to be more flexible and then be more lenient with providing people uh, benefits uh, given the current circumstances, that where they would never uh, approve benefits in, in normal circumstances. All right, let me see if I can get these questions. Um, All right, since nearly all UI claims are being approved, I have an employee who has received approved benefits, although she only worked one day in the last 18 months for our facility. During, to during this time, are appeals being taken seriously and reviewed case by case? My, my guess is they don't have the manpower to get into the weeds on these appeals. That being said, um, if you have a, a, an egregious case where somebody is clearly you know, getting benefits at your experience, my, and it's going to affect your experience modifier, I would still make the appeal, create the written record, and then, you know, at a later point in time, uh, it certainly when the department is not as crazy, you can try to revisit that and ha have them address and analyze your experience modifier 
so that it properly reflects your experience and not is not otherwise inflated. Uh, let's see, if you are called back to work, how do you notify the unemployment office and do you still have to certify? So this, I, this question appears to be if you're an employee and you're called back to work. Well, the employee has to, uh, on, on a weekly basis, go online with the Tennessee Department of Labor and certify that they still qualify. So that's where the employee would be uh, making uh, or putting the Department of Labor on notice as to uh, what their status is, that they've been invited to come back to work and that they've accepted it. Okay, I think, Beth, I've got most of those. You want to pop back to the... You're muted. Sorry, I was having an allergy attack. Um, we have got about 15 minutes left. Yeah. Are you sure it's not a COVID-19 attack? Um, I'm going to say no. I do not have a fever. <laughs> okay. Hey, will you pop to the, uh, or let, before we go to the next slide, then uh, the first bullet point uh, under employee compliance return to work is valid COVID-19 concerns. Listen, my reaction is that if you have an employee who you invite to return to work and they explain to you that they have valid concerns about themselves or a family member, don't jam them up on unemployment. That there's no good that's going to come of that. And, and I wouldn't necessarily, I would not, that's not a scenario where I would be thinking about, okay, when a, later on when I bring more people back and I have, can re-invite this person to come back to work, I'm going to hold it against them that they didn't come back to work because they, they have a valid concern. I think you just need to be flexible. Um, and, and this is different than a normal uh, economic scenario. Um, where, where once somebody turns you down, you're going to be moving on to somebody else. Um, now, that being said, right, you may temporarily re end up replacing that person and find out the temporary replacements are rock star, and you may not have a job later. Well, that, that, that's a different issue, okay? But, but I, would, I would not just foreclose the possibility of returning somebody to work if they tell you, listen, Beth, I, I don't have access to daycare right now or um, my... Uh, you know, my child has an immune disorder. Um, I'm really concerned right now while this uh, COVID-19, the numbers are still tracking upwards and not downwards. You know, uh, can, can you wait just a little bit before I come back to work so I'm less likely to get this virus and bring it home to my immune challenged child, right? I, I think that you're gonna have to be a little bit thoughtful and that goes to sort of that big picture analysis I was talking about earlier. Okay, Beth, go ahead, hit the next slide, please. Um, and so I, I mentioned this, but this is, this is an interesting deal. You know, if you have people who don't come back to work, whether they have a legitimate reason for not returning back to work when, when you make the offer, or they don't, they're just scamming because they like getting, they like making more on unemployment than they are, are earning for you when they, and they actually have to work for it as opposed to sitting home, watching Bart dorm and eating popcorn. Um, you know, you, you can temporarily replace people uh, and, you know, you're free to do that just like you would be in any other scenario. And so then the question becomes, you know, what happens on the back end? Well, you know, uh, this is on there, there, if they have been laid off, they're no longer an employee. So it's not like an FMLA or EFMLA scenario where the right to reinstatement applies. There is no right to reinstatement. The question is, do you have a job for them that they're otherwise qualified? And if you have a temporary replacement who's a rock star, well, you know what? That person may not have a job to come back to. Um, but all that being said, you know, many of you, uh, you know, prior to this, we we're looking at 3% unemployment and virtually no, none of us as employers can find as many qualified people as we want it because the, the talent pool was so slim. That may be a very different scenario. And one of the things where you can make this, uh, use this as an opportunity uh, you know, it, as difficult as the scenario is, you can use this as an opportunity to up your talent pool because so many people have been laid off. There's going to be a lot of high quality talent on the market looking to come back to work. And, and so this is one of those strategic analysis issues is, you know, don't be in such a huge rush to drag people back, especially if they weren't, you know, star performers. It might be better to kind of wait a little bit and post jobs for hire and see what type of talent you get because you may end up finding better, far better talent who are gonna be far more light, uh, motivated to work uh, such that you can end up with a better workforce on the back end of this. Um, and, and obviously, you know, if somebody's not coming back when you make them an offer, 
you know, you can permanently replace them. You just need to do it in a manner that's not going to open you up to discrimination and retaliation claims. That's the deal. If somebody just, it just hypothetically, because somebody started collecting unemployment benefits, um, and, you know, and you, you uh, start, you know, rehiring people. And for example, those who filed unemployment against you, because theoretically it, it jammed, up, jammed you up on your experience modifier, you don't want to hire them back. That's the type of thing that's going to get you sued and it's, it's not going to end up well. Um, and again, the, the benefits are there for a reason, um, you know, and this is, uh, it's good for people to have them, especially in this scenario. But again, that, that's, a, that's a separate issue from how do you structure your reintegration, reopening process and who you're bringing back and who you're not bringing back. And when you're going through that analysis, you want to be thinking about how do I get the best talent in a manner that doesn't open me up unnecessarily to discrimination retaliation claims. All right, Beth, go ahead. Um, yeah, so the group layoff, that spreadsheet, you guys are aware of the fact it's on the TDL site. Um, I mentioned previously, you know, the, the distinction, many people interchange furlough and layoff, but I do have a number of clients. They, the furlough is a very, is, is a distinct creature uh, for some of my clients in that they keep those employees on the group health plan, et cetera, um, such that they are still an employee, so that there are certain rights that that employee has as an employee that don't attach to people who are laid off because they are no longer employed. And for example, once they're no longer employed via a layoff, their rights under the FFCRA, either the paid sick leave or extended FMLA leave, uh, are, are no longer existent. Um, even if they were in the middle of using either, you know, their rights are extinguished as of the date that they're laid off. So there is that substantive uh, difference. And I mentioned this previously, and I won't, I won't spend too much time on it, but the temporary versus permanent layoff, I, I can tell you right now, I, I've been doing um, witness interviews the last couple of days for one of my clients in a scenario in which we laid off a number of people late last year. And most of the people who were laid off, just about all of them were temporarily laid off. Um, and then there was one who was laid off and it was permanent. And, and she was one of the few females and she also was pregnant. Um, now, she was also a horrible employee and, and she was really pretty much worthless uh, as an employee. Um, but you know now we're dealing with an EEOC charge. And, and that is one of these things where if you don't have good records and a good foundation that's uh, factually objective that explains why you are, you know, singling out, you know, 2% of the people you lay off as permanent layoffs, as opposed to temporary layoffs, uh, such that the permanent layoff people, you're not going to offer the opportunity to come back to work. Um, you know, you really are potentially going to have problems with that. So you want to be thoughtful and make sure that, that you are thinking through if I get sued, how do I distinguish between those that I laid off temporarily versus those that I laid off permanently? And what documentation do I have to support it? And if I'm gonna say that it was based on attendance, well, may, we need to make sure that those attendance records are accurate and they exist. If we're gonna say it's based on poor performance, we need to make sure that there's some sort of coaching, counseling, or formal disciplinary documentation that reflects that poor performance that justifies you know, that person being one of the 2% who are permanent layoffs versus everybody else who's a temporary layoff. All right. I think, Beth, from a big picture perspective, that's everything I had. And I had made some notes. Um, I think I've covered my notes. So let me ask, do, do you guys have any other questions you'd like me to try to answer to the best of my ability? Hey, Fred. Before that, we had some questions that were sent in um, on the yes. registration. And yes. Marla uh, uh, replied to some of these, so I just want to briefly go through these. Someone asked, um, does an employer need to respond to claims submitted for unemployment if the employer performs a mass layoff upload to the Jobs for TN website? Um, and then she says, if the employer submits a, mass, a partial mass claim upload, they do not have to respond to each individual claim. That's the benefit of doing the full claim like that. In normal circumstances, it's easier for the employer if he, employer files the partial claim. Um, but because of the delays, um, the sheer number, um, that's the better way to do it. Um, do you know the formula the unemployment office uses to calculate the employee's weekly benefit amount? In order to, to be eligible to receive unemployment benefits, you must have sufficient earnings in your base period from a covered employer. 
The base period is defined as the first four or last five completed calendar quarters. Without sufficient earnings, you will not be eligible to receive benefits. And then um, how do we ensure an employee that has been returned to work still isn't receiving unemployment benefits? I think this kind of came up earlier that Fred addressed. But if an employer opens back up, calls an employee back to work, and the person refuses, then they would need to notify the Department of Labor, that's the employer. At that point, the, the issue of work refusal would have to be investigated, and the claimant would be overpaid and considered fraud from that point. Um, if you bring back an employee to work on Thursday, how will the state pay unemployment for the week, full payout, partial or none? It depends on how much the employee earns during the week and reports during the certification process. If they earn more than 275 in wages during that week, the employee will not be eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, and then we are getting questions about employees being called back to work, but with a reduction in salary, are they required to return to work? They are not required to return to work. However, if you report that they do not return to work, then the claim would be investigated to determine if the individual is still able to draw unemployment. Fred, anything you want to add to those? Yeah, kind of? I do because, uh, and, and number six, Marla, there, there, what this uh, piggybacks on one of the answers I gave previously, and th the question there is how do we ensure an employee that has returned to work isn't still receiving unemployment? And, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but you, you can monitor online uh, the claims that are made um, on your job for tn.gov account, um, and you can submit protests in, in your online account. So, um, yeah, I would, as a regular practice, just make sure you're monitoring that so you can evaluate uh, the claims that are as they're working through the process in real time. And again, make your objections as appropriate. Now, again, how long the TDOL is going to take to, to deal with them? I don't know. I don't expect it to be timely, but at least you'll be on record in a timely manner as having addressed the issue. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We've got about three minutes left. I'm not seeing uh, it new in the chat. Beth, I did want to mention, for those of you who are not signed up for our free electronic newsletter, uh, email me or email Beth, and we'll get you lined up uh, so that uh, you can follow us uh, as we work through this process over the coming months. And I have attempted to record this, so we'll be sharing that, assuming my recording works. And um, I can send you Fred's slides. I'll also send you Fred's um, bio and contact information if any of your organizations want to work directly with Fred going forward. All right, well, thank you all very much. Stay well, and we'll hope to see you in 3D instead of uh, flat Stanleys uh, in the near future. All the best. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Bye.